day. Let me make sure my chat is on. Do me a huge favor and like this and share this. I know it's crazy. I'm on my phone. It feels weird. It feels bad. But this is where the algorithm's at right now. So next week, we'll be on Monday night back in the studio. And then tomorrow night, we'll be in the studio for the podcast. It's going to be an amazing time. Tomorrow night, we have TJ Malkanji on, which you guys know. If you know TJ, you know he brings fire. We need fiery preachers like TJ. He's going to be on the podcast tomorrow at 6 o'clock. You don't want to miss that. But here we are. It's going to be crazy tonight in the chat, just so you guys know. With these mobile live streams, we're in the shorts tab. We're in the live tab, and you're just going to get a lot of people in here. It gets crazy. So mods, all hands on deck. You know, give people a chance. Make sure that you time them out, and then if they still act crazy, you mute them. Let's all be adults here, guys. Thank you, Kelly Parker, for becoming a member. Thank you so much. Let's all be adults here, guys. It's going to be a great night. We're believing for the power and the presence of God to show up in your life. I don't want to do live streaming where it's just information, information, information. I want to see God's presence and power touch your life. I want to see people get healed. I want to see people get delivered. If we serve a supernatural God who has supernatural power, supernatural authority over every sickness, over every demon, then why would we not believe God to do, come on chat, and I have my chat open here right in front of my computer even though I'm on my phone. I'm believing God to do a supernatural work in my life. Did you come hungry today? Did you come desperate today? So be ready tonight for God to move in your life. July 21st, I'm sorry, April 21st. Uh, April, yeah. April 21st, I'll be at Without Walls Church in Mesa, Arizona. Go to my website for all of the info, 10 a.m., get there early. It's going to be packed out, I'm telling you now. If you're in Arizona, April 21st, Without Walls Church, you don't want to miss that. Again, tomorrow night, we'll be live at 6 o'clock with TJ. That's going to be a great time. I have a big announcement coming soon. Not going to make it tonight, but it will be coming soon. Okay, let's jump into this, guys. We're going to pray towards the end as well. I am going to be at my daughter's softball game tonight, helping coach it. I'm helping coach my daughter's softball team. So that's why we're here earlier instead of the six o'clock. But after the next week or two, we will be back to 6 p.m. on Monday night. I just, you know, family over YouTube. So I'm going to be coaching my daughter's game tonight. But I wanted to jump on here and share this message with you guys. The eclipse came and went, and here we are. We're still here, praise the Lord. There was a lot of pastors saying that the rapture would be during the eclipse, there was a lot of influential people saying that this eclipse would signal the wrath of God being poured out, some type of earthquake, some type of hurricane to wipe people out, but it came and it went, and here we are. Most of the world didn't even see it, even though the problem with American Christians are we think that the end time timetable revolves around America. Let me just give you guys a hint, okay? God's end time timetable timeline does not revolve around America. It actually revolves around Jerusalem. Specifically, it revolves around Israel and what's happening in the Middle East because Jesus is coming back to Jerusalem. If you didn't know, he's coming back in Israel. So we're not really like the focal point of end-time Bible prophecy and end-time events, but the solar eclipse was awesome. It just wasn't Jesus coming back. It wasn't the rapture. Now, I'm going to show you tonight, a lot of you have been taught your entire life that the Lord's going to come secretly, you'll never know, your clothes are going to drop on the ground, and you're going to have no clue when the Lord returns. But actually, the Bible doesn't say that. I'm going to show you what the Bible says. The Bible actually tells us we are not going to be surprised by the day of the Lord. Now, I know that's a shock to many of you in the chat right now, but I'm going to show you definitively in Scripture that you will not be surprised if you're in the light in the day of the Lord or the day of the Lord's return. The world will be surprised. The unbeliever will be surprised. The atheist and the agnostic will be surprised, but we will not be shocked in the day of the Lord. I'm going to show you that. So today, we had this beautiful solar eclipse, and it was really creation glorifying God. That is what the Bible says. The Bible says creation glorifies God. Psalms 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. So I saw this as the country proclaiming the glory of God, the, the creation worshiping God in this beautiful event. But it wasn't signaling the rapture. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, look at this, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that no one is without excuse. So because of God's divine nature and divine design, he des designed nature and the glory of nature and the beauty and splendor of nature, nobody has an excuse to say there is no God. Why? Because creation makes us without excuse. Because God's invisible qualities are being made known. His divine nature and divine power is being made known. I saw the solar eclipse as God's divine power, God's divine nature, and God's invisible qualities, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 20, clearly being shown to the country. 
and people are without excuse that there is God. It was, it was crazy. In the middle of the day, it, it went dark. And people are without excuse that God isn't real because these, these signs, which they are signs in creation, not necessarily end time signs, which I'm going to show you that today. They could be, but they are all signs pointing to the greater reality. How many of you know a sign points to a greater reality? That greater reality is there is a God in heaven that loves you and cares about you and wants to change your life. So the stop sign points to the greater reality. And the greater reality is there's a, you need to stop here or you're going to get hit by a car. But the stop sign just points at something. And these signs we see are, great, are pointing to greater realities. A tree is a sign. A star is a sign. The moon is a sign. The sun is a sign. Animals are a sign. They're all signs. You are a sign. Guys, if you didn't know, you are a sign and a wonder. Your life, if you're born again, points to the greater reality, and that is God in heaven. So we are actually all signs. Now, as far as end time signs, I'm going to give you some end time signs to show you that we are in the last days. Let me show you one more verse. Psalms 8, verse 1. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you set in place, who is mankind that you are mindful of them and human beings that you care for them? David is mind blown that he looks at the stars, the galaxies, the eclipse for, for relevancy's sake. And he says, when I look at all of the splendor that God's created, it blows my mind that God thinks about us. God thinks about you. When you look at the splendor of creation, how incredible is it that our God thinks about us, takes time to change our life, to heal us and deliver us. It's an amazing thing. So I want to talk to you about signs of the last days. Now, I'm not going to try to convince you we're in the last days. If you don't believe we're in the last days and you haven't opened up your eyes, then you must be spiritually asleep. I'm not going to try to scare you to get right with God. I want you to realize that even if you don't believe tonight that we are in the last days, you are in your last days. It doesn't even matter. People are like, it's the last days, it's the end times. Honestly, it doesn't matter because right now, you are in the last days. Right now, you don't know if you're going to li be live through this broadcast. You don't know if you're going to be alive in the next 20 minutes. You don't know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. So you actually are living in your last days. And because of that, we need to seize the day. We need to share our faith. We don't need to be fear mongering. We don't need to be freaking out all the time about every sign. Every celebrity says this. Celebrity says this. Celebrity says this. What do you think about it? Who cares? We don't need to be freaked out about everything being a sign. We need to lay hands on the sick. We need to share the gospel. We need to make disciples. We need to baptize people. We need to start fasting. We need to be spiritually sober and be aware of the day that we live in. We need to be like the sons of Issachar and know the times we live in. I know I'm living in the last days. I know the enemy has an agenda. I know the world is dark. I know people are running to and fro and evil and darkness and all of that's happening. But you know what? I'm, I'm called to be the light. Stop, being, uh, stop eclipsing God and covering God and making God's light not shine through you. Somebody will get, some of you will get that on the car ride home. And understand that you are called to shine your light right now. Like guys, 414 Pacific time, 71 degrees outside. The solar eclipse happened a few hours ago. Okay, cool. I'm called to shine my light right now. I'm called to share my faith at work. I'm called to share my faith at school. I'm called to evangelize. I don't need to live my life under a rock, afraid of everything that's going to happen in the world. I'm, I'm going to show you where in the last days. That's what this teaching is about. I'm going to show you the signs. But please, guys, we can't live our life afraid all the time. We can't live our life like worried and constantly under a rock and constantly. And I'm not trying to be rude and I'm not trying to offend you, but some of you need to take the tinfoil hat off and you need to put on the helmet of salvation. Some of you are so busy listening to what the media says and listening to what this right wing or left wing says, and you need to forget about right wing, forget about left wing, and get on the wings of eagles. Fly with God. Soar. Mount up on wings of eagles. Take a new perspective. Okay? We need to, we need to forget about this and that, and I don't know if I'm on that side or that. I'm on the Lord's side. I'm not on their side or on this side. I'm on the Lord's side. That's what the Bible teaches we got to get on the right side of the battle. The battle is real. The war is raging. Darkness is covering the earth. But there, I see a light. Come on, chat. Where are you? I'm reading the chat right now. I see a light shining. I see a remnant rising up. 
I see an army. I see men and women of God on fire for God, passionate for God, seeking the Lord, not getting discouraged, not giving up, not taking no. Satan, you've been denied. I'm not taking no as an answer. I'm, I am advancing God's kingdom. I'm pushing forward the kingdom of God. I'm going to see my family saved. I'm going to see revival in my marriage. I'm going to see revival at my church. I'm going to see awakening. I'm going to live my life on, the, on, on fire and in the move of God. So whatever is happening in the world, cool. I'm living in revival. I'm going to start sharing my faith. We're living in unprecedented times. We're living in the last days, okay? Eternity is right on the side of us. At any moment, you can slip into eternity. 150,000 people die every single day. Why do you think you're exempt? Why do you think you have tomorrow? Yesterday, you kept saying, tomorrow, I'll start fasting. Yesterday, you kept saying, tomorrow, I'll start praying. When, when are you going to do it? When are you going to start praying? And I'm looking like right at you. I'm staring right at you. When are you going to start fasting? When are you going to get involved in your local church? How many more teachings until you start sharing your faith? How many more teachings until you start laying hands on the sick and believing that the supernatural power of God is living in you? That the same spirit that raised Christ has quickened your mortal body. And, I, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to be rude for the sake of being rude. I'm just going like, how many more signs do we need that, to realize we're in the last days? Eternity is right here. We need to pray for the Lord to deliver us from the love of this world. So many of us love the world. We love the culture. And Jesus says, right now, you need to deny yourself and you need to pick up your cross and you need to follow him. So we're in the last days. There's a difference between, I'm going to show you this, the last days and the end times, okay? The last days are anywhere from Jesus' resurrection until now. That's the last days. The end times is the tribulation period, okay? So Luke 21, 28. Jesus said, when you see all these things begin to happen, I'm going to show you those things in scripture here tonight, then you know your salvation is near. It actually, it says, look up, your salvation is near. So when we see all of these signs, and spoiler alert, all the signs are happening right now in front of us, okay, all the signs are happening Jesus talked about, and that's the first time it's ever all happened, then you know your salvation is near. So this is all about a collection of events taking place. Collection, not just one thing, not just two things, a collection of events. And the seven-year tribulation period is considered the end times. That seven years is the end times, but right now we're in the last days. So we're discussing today, not the end. Well, we might discuss the end times if we have time. I'll talk about the tribulation later if we have time. But specifically, this is about the last days, which is what we're living in. And let me, let me show you this, okay? First John chapter 2, verse 18. Look what it says. Dear children... Now, I want you to remember this was written 2,000 years ago. Dear children, the last hour is here. So I, I want you to see this here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. The last hour. We're, the last hour. When was the last hour? 2,000 years ago. The last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this, we know that the last hour has come. So if 2,000 years ago was in the last hour then it's likely we are in the final 10 minutes, five minutes, one minute. When this start, we've been live for 15 minutes. Okay, but we're in the last hour. We're in the last days. So when people say, we're not in the last days yet, you could respond with them and say, actually, you're right. We're not in the last days. We're in the last hour of human history. We're, we are in that moment where we've seen the signs. Okay, we're not panicked. We're not freaking out. The solar eclipse was beautiful, but it was not the rapture, like we've been saying. Okay, the judgment of God will come upon the earth, but it's not right now. So while we're here, we don't need to freak out and panic. Like we always say, don't panic, Hispanic. You need to share your faith. You need to disciple. You need to evangelize. You need to raise your kids. You need to be involved in your local church. You need to be praying. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be posting every 15 seconds on social media some conspiracy about how the eclipse passed the seven cities of Nineveh, which there's not seven cities in Nineveh. Just saying, okay, you don't need to, you don't need to freak out about it. You need to realize that John says 2,000 years ago, we're in the last hour. Now, the Bible actually tells us what people are going to look like in the last days. These are signs of what the world's going to look like in the last days. So you can look around at society and say, yeah, this is the temperament of people. This is the temperature. And our goal, again, is not to predict 
the return of the Lord. The Bible tells us we're not going to be shocked by the return of the Lord. I'm going to show you that later, so stay on this video. I'm going to show you later that the Bible teaches you will not be surprised at the day of the Lord's return. The world will be surprised. Those that are under the judgment of God will be surprised, but the Christian will not be shocked at the day of the Lord. I'm going to show you that. Stay with me, okay? Here's a few signs we're in the last days. These are how people are going to be. And the people I'm about to describe, I'm actually going to shock you when I tell you who these people are because these people are probably not where you think they are. But these are going to be the people in the last days. Number one, they will be boastful and proud and lovers of self. Hmm. This is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. It says people will only, this is last days, the people in the last days, people will only love themselves and their money they will be boastful and proud. They will scoff at God, disobedient to their parents. They will be ungrateful and they will consider nothing sacred. Does this not describe our society? I can only speak for America because I'm American, so fill in the blank. Does this not describe people in the last days? What is the biggest movement right now that is pushing itself into the White House, pushing itself into culture, pushing itself into social media, pushing itself, pushing its agenda superimposing its agenda over Christianity. Type it in the chat, what is the movement? What is the movement called? What is the word they use? I'll give you a hint. It's the same sin that Satan was cast out of heaven for. It's what? Pride. I'm just gonna say it. They might ban me, whatever. I'm not, I don't care. Cancel me. All right, get mad, cry all you want. Gay pride. Proud. Pride will be premier. It'll be on the forefront of the personality archetype of the last days. These people will be arrogant. They will be proud. They will love money. This is what we see all these celebrities, this fame. Now you might say, well, that's been that way for thousands of years. No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't. People have not been lovers of self like they are now a thousand years ago. I'm going to tell you why, because there was no social media a thousand years ago. Guys, think about this, okay? Now, I'm, I do social media. I reach people, and it's beautiful, reaching hundreds of millions of people for the glory of God. Praise the Lord. But think about how popular selfies are. Think about, th just think about, think about the inception of social media. I'm going to, let's for example, say Facebook. I'm going to go on Facebook. I'm going to make a page all about myself, all about me. And I'm going to tell you what I like, what I like to eat, what I like to do where I like to go. I'm going to post pictures of my workouts and my food and my life and all of that. And that's great. Cool. Awesome. I'm going to post a million selfies, all this stuff, the right angle. And then I'm going to wait for people to like me, like my post. So what that does is it's created an entire generation of people who only love themselves. Second Timothy three, two for people only love themselves. So now we're seeing selfishness, pride, the pride movement rise up. It's a sign of what? The last days. A hundred years ago, there was no pride movement. So this has to be speaking about current times now that we're going into. Pride. The Bible says in the last days, people only love themselves. Self-absorbed. Love of self. Selfies. All of that. Okay? Number two. Here's another sign of how people are going to be. They will be unloving. 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. They're going to be unloving unforgiving, they will slander others, and they will have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. I'm describing humanity in the last days. Does this not describe them perfectly? I, all the horrific videos we see of people, of these mass shootings, these mass killings, people like, you see these videos that are so horrific of a young guy getting jumped by 10 other guys. And I don't even want to describe them because they're just horrific, right? These people are unloving. They have no self-control. They're cruel. They're cruel. They hate what is good. Guys, our culture hates what is good. Am I preaching the truth? Let me know in the chat. Anything that is good, you become a bigot. If you do what is right, you're a bigot. They hate you. They don't love you. Everything that's viral and trending is negative. It's bad. It's demonic. It's cruel. It's slander. People are unloving. People are unforgiving. It's every man for themselves. That is that spirit of the Antichrist that is at work in the last days. In these last days, this is what we're seeing right now. Don't you see it in culture? Don't you see it in crime every day? Don't you see the hatred happening right now when you turn on the news? The love of many has grown cold in our society. And this is what the Bible describes here. 
We're seeing the most heinous acts in human history. These terrorist attacks, have, they've never happened, guys. These are the birth pains. These are the last day birth pains. Number three, they'll be lovers of money. Money will be the main idol that people worship. It'll be all about money. Countries will go to war over money. People will kill family members over money. People will work 40, 50, 60 hours, have no life just to make a little bit more money. In our day, people seek fame and fortune more than they seek the Lord. Is that true? We spend eight to 10, eight to 10 hours a day at work trying to climb the ladder, but give God 15 minutes in prayer, 15 minutes of a sermon we listen to. And that's normal Christian behavior. Guys, normal Christian behavior is 15 hours a day, 12 hours a day commuting at work, 12 hours a day working, all of that, which we should all work, praise the Lord. But we overwork, we double work ourselves 16 hour days to climb the ladder. And then we give God 15 minutes. Why? Because we are lovers of money. We love money and money's not evil. Money is the root of evil. The love of money is the issue. So lovers of money is another sign. Number four, sign, one of the, some of the signs of the last days, what society will look like in the last days. Lovers of pleasure. Paul makes another relevant statement. He says in these last days, and I'm going to show you where these people are. And it's crazy when you see this here in a minute. These people be lovers of pleasure. We live in this, do whatever you want, do whatever makes you feel good. It's the same movements that are perverted, that are demonic. This whole OnlyFans, pornography, porn culture that we live in right now. Guys, this is what we're living in right now. A pornography culture is all about pleasure. And no matter what twisted pleasure you have, what twisted thing you want to do, it's not wrong as long as you feel good. As long as you feel good, right? You're not hurting anybody. You get pleasure, 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 pleasure. When it comes to drugs, when it comes to alcohol, when it comes to vaping, when it comes to sex, when it comes to the ph pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical industry, all of these things, releasing that pleasure, releasing that pleasure. So number four is these people will be lovers of pleasure. And our culture is fueled by sex and drugs. It is. Why? Because they give you pleasure and people love pleasure more than they love obeying God. But you have to understand God's the one that invented pleasure. He knows true pleasure. He knows true satisfaction. It's only gained in him. And we live in a world where, where they see good as evil and evil as good. Where me and you standing up for biblical marriage, biblical manhood, biblical anything, we're, we're now like, oh, those people. Oh, that guy. We don't want to give that guy any promotion. We don't want that guy's page to reach people. We don't want that guy. Uh, oh, you're the, one of those guys? You're just like pushed to the side. Oh, you're a Christian. Oh, you're one of those Christians that, oh man. You're just pushed to the side because now whatever is good, the world considers it evil to be good. And whatever is evil, the world considers good. We've seen this flip in society upside down. Okay. Number five, they will be religious hypocrites. Now look what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 5. It tells you about all these things about these people, lovers of pleasure, lovers of self. And we're like, these people are evil. These people are wrong. But actually it's describing believers. Believers in the last days. Because look at what, what, what Paul tells Timothy. They will have a form of godliness, but deny the power of God. How many churches right now on Sunday have a form of godliness, but deny the power of God? How many churches where we act Christian, we look Christian, we talk Christian, but the power of God is not in the church. The power of the Holy Spirit is not in the church. Guys, we are living in a power outage in the American church. And this is what it's talking about. You'll, they'll, these people that love self, pleasure, all that, these last day people, they will act religious. They'll have a form of godliness, but they'll deny the very power that can make them like God. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. We are in denial. We don't really need miracles. We don't really need... I'm like, hey, I look like they're here describing cessationists over here. I don't know. It sounds like cessationists to me. They have a form of godliness. But they deny the power that can make them like God. The Holy Spirit has given us power to walk like Jesus walked. To live like Jesus lived. And what happens is religion wants to neuter you. 
Religion wants to tell you, you don't need the power of God. You don't need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You don't need the unction of the Holy Ghost. You can kind of just, you know, have the form, but deny the power. Last days, last days church will be a powerless church. The last days church will be a church that is not walking in authority, not walking in power, not walking in freedom, not walking in that supernatural unction the Holy Spirit gives us. And then look what it says here. Also, people are going to be, where'd this go? Oh, that's weird. Anyways, people are going to be mockers in the last days. That's number six. Okay. Am I describing the last days? Are you not convinced we're in the last days? They will be mockers. They will scoff. They will mock the truth and they will follow their own desires. And they will say, what happened to the promise? Jesus is coming again. They're going to scoff. So there's a balance here. Okay. We don't want to be scoffers. I did not get on this broadcast and say, oh, ha ha ha. The eclipse didn't, ha you know, the rapture didn't happen. All you eclipse people. I didn't come on here making fun of everybody about the eclipse and all that. I didn't get on here making jokes. I don't want to be a scoffer. I'm like, hey, Lord, I'm, I'm waiting for the day of the Lord. I'm patiently waiting. So we want to make sure that we're speaking truth, that we don't think the world's ending every day because every sign, ha you know, every a, a tree falls over in South Africa. And we say, oh, that was a sign that the golden tree was going to fall over according to the book of Revelation. We don't want to live our lives like that, where everything is a sign. But we also don't want to become mockers. We don't want to become scoffers and say, well, the end's not coming. This is what 2 Peter 3.3 3 says. I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come. They will mock the truth and they will follow their own desires. They will say, this is what mockers say, what happened to the promise of Jesus coming again? From before the time of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world has cre been created. So these mockers say, there's no signs. So, so here you have one extreme, everything's a sign. And here you have another extreme, nothing's a sign. But we need to be right there in the middle and be sober and say, oh, there are signs. I'm giving you signs tonight. We're seeing the signs, but also we don't want to panic all the time. We want to live in that middle Bible area. I believe the Bible's in the middle. I believe scripture's in the middle. So that's right here. Like We don't want to be scoffing and saying nothing's changed. Things have changed. Earthquakes, I'm going to show you. Wars, pestilence, these are at an all-time high. And again, it's the culmination of signs. It's not just one sign. Jesus says when you see all of these signs coming, all of these signs, know that your salvation is near. So now we're talking about the culmination of signs. Lots of signs. And that's what we're seeing. And that's why I believe we're in the last days. That's why I believe, you know, the honestly, guys, we don't know the exact moment the tribulation will start. Okay? We don't know the exact moment. The Bible doesn't tell us a specific event where, boom, the tribulation starts. Now, if you're pre-trib, like I used to be, you're going to say, well, the church gets raptured. That's the start of the tribulation. Unfortunately, that's not what the Bible teaches. So, but we know, I believe in right now, the tribulation could start at any time, at any time. But I'm going to show you that you're not going to be shocked when the Lord returns because I'm going to show you the Bible teaches that. So here's what he goes on to say about judgment. He says, dear friends, now here's what you have to understand. Peter is going to give us a prophetic insight to timing, to God's timing. Okay, so pay attention right here. He says this. This is in 2 Peter 3. He says, Dear friends, a day is like a thousand years to God, and a thousand years is like a day. Verse 9. The Lord is not being slow. If you're sitting here going like, when's God coming back? He's taking forever. It's been 2,000 years. He goes, mm -mm. The Lord is not being slow as some of you think. No, he's actually being patient for your sake. So because he doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord, look at this, will come as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with the terrible noise and the elements will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Verse 11, since everything around us is going to be destroyed with holy and godly lives, we should live looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in flames. But we are looking forward to new heavens and a new earth as promised. Now this is talking about when we get a new heaven and new earth. The new heavens, the new Jerusalem, which will be created a new earth, and the new heaven will come to the new earth. I have, Guys, I have like 50 hours of teachings on the book of Revelation. Just go to my channel, playlist, Revelation End Time Events. But look at this. We're looking forward. For God, or a new earth he has promised, the, a world filled with God's righteousness. But notice what he says here. God is actually not, hasn't come yet, not because he's slow or a liar. He's like, well, he said he's coming back. No, 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 no. Not because he's slow or he's a liar, 
but because he wants everybody to get saved. Guys, are you catching this? God is giving your unsafe family time to get saved. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. God is giving my unsafe family. God is giving my unsafe friends. God is giving my unsafe coworkers time. The Lord says, I'm going to give you more time to reach them. You are on the clock right now. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. The Lord is so compassionate. He goes, I just haven't come back yet. Not because I'm slow. Not because I don't want to come back. I'm actually just being patient. I want to see maximum people saved. Now, there's going to come a time where the Lord says enough is enough. We're so evil. We're so weak, wicked. As in the days of Noah, so will the coming of the, second, coming of the Son of Man be. God says enough is enough. There's too much wickedness. There's too much evil. I'm coming back. That will come. That will happen. But right now, guys, understand right now, God's being patient. So we're in a time of what? Patience. The patience of God. Thank you, Lord. Come on, chap. Thank you, Lord, for giving me time to preach to my family. Now, don't waste God's time. Thank you, Lord, for giving me time to reach people. So what should we do? Now, this is amazing here. Because the Bible, I hope I'm helping some of you tonight. Let me know in the chat if I am or am I just, yeah, we're live right now, um, Lindsay. We're live. I'm staring at the chat. That's where my eyes are at here, okay? Look at what it's going to tell us. It's going to tell us how we should live our life. So you're in the chat. There's uh, about 1,700 of you. If you'll share this, we could probably get more people on. Like it, share it. That'll be great. It actually tells us what we should do. What should I do right now while I'm waiting? Because we're in the last days. We're waiting. We're in the waiting period. What should we do? Okay, look at this. Verse 14. Uh, where am I? I'm in 2 Peter 3, 14. Look at this. Dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, what things? The new Jerusalem to come. The new earth. The heavens melting away. The fire of God burning up God's enemies. The wrath of God consuming people. What should we do while we're waiting? That's a great question. I'm curious. Make every effort to be found living peaceful lives. Wow. Wow. That's going to hurt some of you that are always fighting with everyone on social media. Peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. So what am I called to be doing right now? Now, the Bible does tell me in one place to work with my hands. But what am I called to be doing? Living peaceful. Not arguing with everybody on social media. Not getting in a fight with everybody. Not constantly debating, constantly getting angry, constantly bickering, constantly arguing and fighting with everybody I can. Peaceful. Live a peaceful life so that I can be pure and blameless. Guys, we're not called to have our nose in everybody else's business, worry about everything going on in the world. We are called to live peaceful. We are called to live lives of prayer, lives of dedication, lives of worship. God is not a sl slow. God is not a liar. So we are called. So understand though, right now, these signs we're seeing, the earth is in labor. The earth is actually in labor right now. So all of these wars, let me give you a few of them. Wars, okay? Earthquakes, pestilence, that means global sickness. We just had one of those pestilences recently. That was unprecedented. A sign, a sign, Jesus says. Um, uh, persecution, nation rising up against nation. When you see these things, you can go, oh, these are actually labor pains. The earth, the earth is in labor. And these are contractions. And the closer the contractions get, I have four kids. How many of you know how contractions work? You have them every 10 minutes. The doctor says, go home, wait till they're every five minutes. The, the actual time we know the baby's coming is when the contractions get closer. So now it's like earthquake, earthquake, earthquake. They're happening more rapid. Tsunamis, hurricanes, sicknesses, uh, wars. Matthew 24, they're happening more often. That's how we know that the Lord's approaching. Now, if you look up earthquakes, you're going to see it's like 10x every year the year before. They're increasing, increasing, increasing. Why? The earth is in labor. The earth is in labor. And look at this. Romans chapter 8, verse 19. I'll prove it to you. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The world is waiting on the sons of God, us, to be revealed. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God. So a, a, a simple way to say it is Romans 8.19 is saying the world's under a curse. When Adam sinned, 
It wasn't just humanity that came under the curse. Creation came under a curse. And creation is eagerly waiting. They're waiting for the glory which shall be revealed in us. God's going to reveal his glory when we get our glorified bodies in that day. And the world is waiting to also be redeemed from that curse. Okay? It's, it's leaning forward. It literally means like when you're listening to a really riveting good preacher and you're on the edge of your seat listening to every word they say, creation is on the edge of its seat like this, leaning forward, waiting on the sons of God to be revealed. Romans 8, 22. For we know, look at this, that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. So the earth is groaning. It has birth pains, contractions. It's in labor. These are labor pains. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the spirit, even ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our body. That's when we get our glorified body. Okay, the earth is in labor, having contractions, but so are we. We are also in labor, waiting on the Lord's return, waiting on the Lord to vindicate his people and establish his throne. So we are hoping, we are waiting, we are persevering, but what we're seeing, guys, not the solar eclipse. I, I think the solar eclipse was beautiful, and we glorified God, and it happens every few years. Um, but that's not what Jesus said in Matthew 24, that the signs are going to be. When he talked about signs in the star and moons, that was actually during the tribulation, when the moon's blood, all of that. That was not the solar eclipse, guys. Definitively was not the solar eclipse. But the signs we do see are earthquakes, wars, nation against nation, men's heart growing cold, people being lovers of pleasure, people being arrogant, boastful, proud. Those things actually are happening. Those things are happening, okay? So that's when we see the last days is where we're in now and the end times, the end times being the tribulation period. And, the, and by the way, the tribulation period is the most talked about portion of time in all of scripture. It's the most talked about more than the Exodus, more than the first coming of Jesus, the second coming of Christ, the tribulation period is the most talked about. What's up, Pastor Mike Signorelli? Love you, bro. Appreciate you. Is the most talked about time. We're not going to be shocked when we're in the tribulation. Nobody's going to be like, oh, I didn't know we were in the tribulation as fires falling from heaven, boils are pour getting released on people. Nobody's dying for five months. Millions of soldiers are torturing people. No one's going to be shocked. We're not going to be surprised in the tribulation. So we're not trying to predict the times. We're trying to be aware of them. But let me show you and let me kind of debunk this whole American thinking that we're all going to be shocked in the day of the Lord. Okay, this is going to kind of mess up your theology, but let me just uh, mess it up a little bit. Okay, now let me let me go here first. Okay, now we always been taught the Lord's going to come back and surprise us all. We're going to have no clue as Christians like, oh, I did not see that coming. I want you to look at First Thessalonians. Look at what First Thessalonians chapter five, verse one says. And I want you to pay attention here because I'm about to show you that we don't have to be scared all the time. We're not going to be shocked. Again, the world will be shocked. Guys, remember, oh, I don't know if I have time to go into this. I don't want to confuse you. Remember in Matthew 24, where it says, as in the days of Noah, so the son of man be. And it says one person gets taken out of the field, the other gets left. Do you realize when it's talking about getting taken, it's describing, and I know I'm opening a can of worms, so I'll teach you this later on another broadcast. Do you know it's describing the people that were getting taken away by the flood were the unbelievers, not the believers, were the people in sin? Let me ask you this. Was Noah shocked when the rain started? No, of course not. He built a boat. He had 100 years to build a boat. He knew the rain was coming. Who was surprised? I'm, I'm going to show you in scripture before you get mad at me. Who was surprised, guys, at the, the rain coming? The wicked unbelievers. They were the ones that were shocked. Noah was not shocked. The taken away is speaking of the unbelievers. It, like in the days of Noah, when they got taken away in the flood, so in the day of the Lord, some will be taken, some will be left. Taken away, swept into the wrath of God, surprised by the wrath of God. But again, we've mixed it up, and that's why some of you are going to get so mad at me, because for 100 years we've learned in church, the taken away is you getting raptured suddenly, you're not even going to know. That's not what he's saying. He's describing how in the flood, the wicked were taken away. They were shocked. And as in the days of Noah, who gets shocked? The unbelievers. Noah wasn't surprised. Noah knew he was building an ark, guys, for 100 years. He knew the flood was coming. We know the flood's coming. So now let me prove to you that you're not going to be shocked in the day of the Lord, okay? And I know, guys, I know that this is like, 
makes you guys mad because you got taught with the left behind theology, which is not scriptural that, hey, be careful because your clothes are going to be on the ground and you're going to be taken up. Guys, we get raptured at the end of the tribulation. We get taken up in the air. We meet Christ in the air. And then we return as a heavenly army with Christ down to the earth for the battle of Armageddon. That's like what the Bible teaches. Okay, this like preacher of rapture theology is not scriptural. Because if you believe in a preacher of rapture, you believe in three comings. You believe he comes the first time, dies on the cross, comes the second time to rapture the church, and then comes the third time as the second coming. It's impossible. He doesn't come three times. He comes twice. He came and died on the cross. He's coming back to rapture us, meet us in the air, and then return as a heavenly army. That's what the Bible says. Okay, again, I'm not going to preach your poster rapture. I'll do another video on that. But it, let me now show you. Let me now show you that you're not going to be surprised. All right, here you go. You ready? Love you, but disagree. Praise the Lord, Courtney. I love you too. You can still, you can still follow and be a part. This is not salvific. If you don't believe me, it's okay. But let me just show you that you're not going to be shocked, even though you might think you are. You're not going to be. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Now concerning how and when all of this will happen. What are we talking about here? First of all, we're talking about the day of the Lord. Look at this. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. Now, now we're going to talk about the day of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, this is what Paul says to the church in Thessalonica. Pay attention here. We don't really need to write you, Paul says. And I quote verse 2. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. Now you're like, Isaiah, you're contradicting yourself. But pay attention here. Verse 2. Let me read it one more time. Very important. We know quite well the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. Amen. Amen. Watch. Verse 3. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall upon them. Suddenly, as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin and there will be no escape. Okay, so it seems to be Paul is saying it's going to be unexpected. It's going to be like a thief in the night. So Isaiah, what are you talking about? I'm going to show you. Verse 4, 1 Thessalonians 5. And those of you are like, this is false teaching. Take it up with the Bible because I'm literally quoting the Bible word for it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4. Ready for this? This is where the narrative changes. So here we are, the unbeliever, it's unexpected like a thief. Verse 4, 1 Thessalonians 5. Are you guys ready? Here we go. But you, you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters. And you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. Let me read that one more time. Guys, are you, are you, are you seeing this? Yes, the receipts are in the Bible. I'm giving you receipts. Let's read it one more time. Verse 4, 1 Thessalonians 5. And the reason why I'm harping on this and staying here, because this goes against what you've been taught. And so I have to say this. And I, it goes against what I was taught. I read this was like, my mind is blown emoji. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4. But you are not in the dark about these. And you will not be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. So you won't be surprised, but the world will be surprised. Kind of like, as in the days of Noah in Matthew 24, when Jesus returns, they will get taken away in the flood of his judgment, and they will be surprised, but we won't, okay? So check my facts here. Look this up. Then look at what verse 5 says. Here's why you won't be surprised in the day of the Lord. Well, we know it's going to be at the end of the tribulation, so we're not going to be surprised because we know what the tribulation is because we have the Bible. But also, here's why. This is the key here. Now, if you're not this, what I'm about to read, you're going to be surprised. Verse 5. Here's why you're not surprised. Verse 5. For you are children of the light and of the day. We do not belong to darkness and night. Verse 6. So be on guard. Don't be asleep like the others. I quote, stay alert and be clear-headed. That literally means to be sober and to watch and pray. Verse 7. Night is the time when people sleep and people and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light, be clear-headed, be sober, be sober, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Wow! Guys, this whole verse here, this whole paragraph obliterates this false any moment teaching, right? Should we be on guard? Of course! Should we be ready at any moment? Of course! But this idea that at any moment, randomly, we're going to get sucked up in the air is not in the Bible. We get raptured at the end of the tribulation. Okay? We get raptured. And then we meet the Lord in the air because there's only two comings. That's the second coming again. 
And then all of a sudden we meet the Lord in the air and we come back as a heavenly army. But clearly, definitively, Paul is saying right here, you will not be shocked. You will not be surprised because you're a child of the light. Now, if you're a Christian that's a drunkard, you're a sleeping Christian, yeah, you're going to be shocked. But you're not going to be surprised if you're a biblical Christian and you're looking at these signs and you're wondering, you're wondering of the day of the Lord, okay? Now, look at what 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 1 says. Now, since we're talking about the end times, can I just keep going for a few more minutes? Okay, I have, I have a couple more minutes here to stay on. Um, I do have to get off in a while here, but I have some more time. Let me just read you this because I want to make these things very clear. I don't want to be too eccentric here. I just want to, I just want to make these things clear to you guys. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. This is actually titled as event prior to the Lord's second coming. That's literally the title of this event prior to the Lord's second coming. So it's about to describe the events before the Lord's coming. Verse two of second Thessalonians chapter two. Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some, th some things about the coming of our Lord Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be easily shaken or alarmed by those who say the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter from us, don't believe them. So again, the eclipse, for example, the solar eclipse is going to pass through these cities and this, and it's going to signal the rapture, and we're going to get taken up and that's the, he's like, don't, don't believe them. Don't, don't be alarmed and shaken by these. Some of you sold a bunch of stuff because you thought that you weren't going to be here right now because you were going to get taken in the eclipse. Don't be, don't be, don't believe them. Look what it says in verse three. And don't be fooled by what they say. For the day of the Lord will not come until there's a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself above everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God and claim to be God himself. Okay, this is speaking of the Antichrist. The Antichrist has to rise up, claim to be God, sit in the temple of God and have people worship him. Is that happened yet? No. Is there a global Antichrist? No. That's why like people are always like, that's the mark of the beast. Careful, that's the mark of the beast. Guys, there can't be a mark of the beast without a beast. There is no antichrist yet. He might be alive, but he hasn't risen to power yet. There's not a global world peace leader that the Bible describes as the antichrist that makes people worship and pledge their allegiance to him globally. And until that's the case, there can't be no mark if there's no beast. So there is no mark of the beast yet. There has to be a beast for there to be a mark. And I have all these videos on the mark of the beast. And I know people get mad like, oh, brother, I don't know why. Oh, help me, Lord. I don't know why you guys so badly want everything to be the mark of the beast. Like, why do you want everything to be the mark of the beast? Oh, that app is the mark of the beast. Oh, you, Isaiah, your QR code people scan to give to your website. That's the mark. The QR code's the mark of the beast. Like, guys, no, stop. Why do we want everything to be the end and, and the mark of the beast? Like, be glad it's not the end times. Be glad the tribulation hasn't started. So we have time to preach and evangelize and drink watermelon, hint water. Be glad the end isn't here. But look at this. Verse 5. Don't you remember that I told you all about this when I was with you, Paul says? And you know what is holding him back or he, for him to be revealed when his time comes? For this lawlessness is already at work secretly. So the lawlessness is at work secretly, okay? And it will remain secret until the one who's holding it steps out of the way. That is the restrainer. That is the Holy Spirit. God has to step out of the way and allow that man of lawlessness to be revealed, okay? And some of you, okay, I'm not going to go there. Verse eight, then the man of lawlessness will be revealed and Jesus, so the man of lawlessness is the Antichrist and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. The splendor of his coming. Verse nine, this man, so it's going to describe the Antichrist who's not here yet. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and wonders and miracles. He will use every evil deception to fool those who are on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and believe these lies. And they will be condemned by enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. So these people are going to be condemned because they're going to enjoy evil. They're not going to believe God. They're not going to believe the truth. And God is going to condemn them, the Bible says. So this is that Antichrist. But there is no Antichrist yet. Now, the disciples explicitly, let me just go a couple more minutes here. I'll have to do a part two of this at some point because I have 
I'm in like, I'm in the first like 20% of my notes here, but the disciples explicitly ask Jesus the end. I'm not going to read all through all of this, but Jesus basically says this in Matthew 24, people are going to be coming, claiming to be the anointed one, the Christ, the false, the Messiah, all of these things. But then the Lord says, there's things that have to happen. Okay. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, which we're hearing about right now. He says, these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation will go against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, which we're having now, pestilences, which is global sicknesses. We just saw one of those earthquakes in various places. All of these things are the beginning of sorrows. These are the beginning of sorrows. So before the end comes, the Lord says, these things are the beginning of the sorrows before the ending. So I believe now I'm not going to give you exact verse. I don't have an exact verse. I don't have an exact this or that. I just personally believe from my study and I've spent hundreds of hours studying the book of revelation, teaching on the book of revelation and all of that, the best of my knowledge, I believe personally, the tribulation can start at any time. I believe the tribulations can start at any moment. The Bible doesn't give us an exact event, but we're going to see signs taking place and we're going to know that the, the tribulation has started. It would not surprise me in our lifetime. It wouldn't surprise me if we, the tribulation started. Now it might not, it might not start for another 300 years. I'm just telling you based on the signs, we know that there is basically the, the branches are budding. In Matthew 24, 32, this is what Jesus says. Now learn the lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves, leaves begin to sprout, you know, summer is near. In the same way, when you see all of these things, you can know his return is at the near, right at the door. All of these things, what things? I just said, nation going against nation, global sicknesses, earthquakes. And we got to stick true to what the Bible says. Specifically, wars, okay, we're seeing those now, earthquakes, and global sicknesses. Those are the three main ones that the Bible tells us about, which are we seeing an increase? Of course we are. Every one of us knows that's true. So when we see those signs, then you'll know his return is very near. Another one that's going to be one of the last ones, main ones, that we haven't seen yet globally, it's almost global, but not here in America, persecution. Let me just, let me, let me find this. Okay. Here it is. Um, verse nine of Matthew 24, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You'll be hated by all the nations. Many will be offended, and betrayed, hate one another. And many false prophets will rise and deceive many and lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow cold. Okay. So all of these things have happened, but one of the main ones that I think we're, we're waiting for, or well, I don't want to say waiting for it because it's not a good thing to happen, but it will grow the gospel is we will be killed in every nation. All of the nations will deliver us up and kill us. So will there come a time like that in America? Possibly. We're already headed to extreme censorship, losing your job, losing your license, losing your tax ID status, all of this stuff. If you speak out against certain communities, it's considered hate speech. It's considered conversion therapy. CPS is now entering people's homes, taking kids from families because they're not willing to give them hormone blockers and change their gender. So we're already seeing it's sliding that way. And Christianity has those godly values that is opposite of what the culture teaches. So these are signs. Okay, let me give you another sign is an increase of travel and knowledge. This is another sign that we're seeing right now. 600 years before Jesus came, an angel came to Daniel in Daniel 12 verse 4 and said, seal up this book until the end of time when travel and knowledge will increase. Okay, interesting uh, mystery there. What the angel is saying is there's going to come an era where there's going to be an explosion of advancements in travel. People can travel like never before and an advancement in knowledge. Okay, let's just think here. For hundreds of years, and I'm going to say this slowly to get you wrapped around this. Hundreds of years, there was no advancement in travel. Think about that. Hundreds of years, thousands of years, there was no advancement in travel. There was no airplane. There was no travel in the air. There was no electric cars, fast cars, none of that. For hundreds of years, thousands of years, there was no, yeah, slow, slow, as slow as I can go. There was no, and then all of a sudden, what happened? An explosion of travel. In the last 200 years, two things have exploded, travel and knowledge. Now we have airplanes. We have cars that drive themselves. Guys, we have explosion of travel now, right? That's what Daniel 12 talks about. And then explosion of knowledge. Right now, 
We have the most knowledge we've ever had in human history. Right now, the most knowledge we've ever had in human history is right now. So we've seen an explosion of knowledge with AI now. Guys, you can go, this is crazy, to chat GPT and ask it anything. And AI will instantly scour all of the internet, all of the internet, and get you the information you want in less than a second. Tell me when that's been around. Oh wait, when has that been around? For all of you that are like, oh, Lord's not coming. How long has that been around for? A year? Two years? A sign of the last days. So yes, AI is a sign. Now, AI is not evil in itself. It's like, oh, AI, don't use chat. That's not what I'm saying. But AI, the advancement of technology is a sign that we are heading towards the end times, which is the tribulation. We're in the last days, headed towards the end times. So these are a signaling of the start of the tribulation period. And again, we won't be shocked when the tribulation starts. We won't be shocked when we're in the tribulation. It'll be the most horrific time in human history. Matthew 24, 31 says, there will be greater for there will be greater anguish than any time since the world began, and it'll never be so great again. So it'll be the, the greatest day of anguish. In fact, let me give you a few of the names. We'll do a part two all about the tribulation. I've done a bunch of videos on it, by the way, but we'll do, we'll do a part two at some point. But these are the names the Bible uses to describe the great tribulation. The day of calamity, the day of the Lord, the terror of the Lord, the day of reckoning, the day of the Lord's vengeance, the day of wrath, the day of trouble, uh, a day of darkness, or the wrath to come, the hour of temptation, the great day of the wrath of the Lamb, the hour of judgment, the wrath of God and the tribulation. Those are all described, used to describe the tribulation. And we are not in that yet. Guys, we are not in that yet. We are heading there, but we are not in that. So what... In recap, what should we be doing while we wait? We should be living peaceful, blameless lives, praying, fasting, getting in the word of God, being involved in a local church, being involved in what God is doing, and seeking the Lord until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we pray tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name, God, that you will help us, Lord. God, help us to have eyes to see. Help us, Lord, to have ears to hear. God, I pray right now that you would open our eyes, God. Anyone that's sleeping right now, I pray, Holy Spirit, open their eyes. God, open their eyes that they will not be blind to these end time signs. They will not be blind to what you are doing. But I pray, Lord, that they will have eyes to see. I pray that they will have ears to hear. I pray that they will know what you're saying and what you're doing, that you will sober them up, that they will be sober in Jesus' name. God, help us to be sober Lord, help us to not be blown to and fro. Lord, help us to not be lukewarm and complacent. Help us to not be spiritually drunk. But God, help us to be sober in these days. God, I pray right now we would sober up. I pray right now we would have open eyes. I pray right now, God, you'd give us a vision. you give us a heavenly vision, God, of what's to come. Lord, help us to pray. Help us to fast. I pray you'd break fear off of people. If you have terror and fear of the end of the year world or you're going to get disappear right, right, suddenly, all that, God's going to break the spirit of fear off you. God has not given you a spirit of fear. God, I pray help those that are living in terror and anguish and fear. And God, I pray the only thing they would fear is you. Guys, let us have the fear of the Lord. Let us have the fear of the Lord, not the fear of the end times, not the fear of tomorrow we're going to all float away and the world's going to end. We're not afraid. Even if we're in, say we're in the tribulation, we're not afraid. The Lord is with us. He's faithful and just, and we'll be able to stand. We'll be able to say no to the mark of the beast. God will be with us. I don't know if I can go through it. You will be able to. God will be with you. Do not be afraid, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Lord, I pray that we will fear you only. I pray God break the spirit of fear off of us. Satan, you have no power, no authority. You've lost. You've been defeated. Jesus is king. And I just pray, Lord, that you would reign. You would anoint every person watching. I pray that they would retain everything that I taught tonight, God. I pray they would get in the word of God. They would have a hunger for the word of God. And that, Lord, you would be glorified in this broadcast tonight. Jesus, I give you all the honor, the glory, and praise. It's all about you, Lord. It's not about me. It's not about Isaiah. Isaiah is nobody. All, all I am is someone that said yes to God. I'm not a celebrity. I'm not none of, none of that. Lord, I pray you would have all the honor, all the glory, and praise, God. Let us not be in delusion, God. Let us not be in error. Let us not be in heresy, but God, let us walk according to your word. Let us stay humble, holy, righteous, and full of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Guys, I know it feels weird that I'm on the mobile phone. It's a little different. Hey, maybe you guys like it. Let me know if you like it. Maybe it's a little change. It feels bad that I have like 
you know, my mic here, my cameras. I will be back in the studio tomorrow for the podcast at six o'clock. I really want you guys all to pray about sewing into the ministry. We constantly need support. We're crowdfunded. Our content is free. So we do need your guys' support. If you are blessed tonight by the word, I want you to please uh, sew right here on this link in the comments or in the description. You like it? I'm glad you guys like it. Up close and personal. Yeah. Hey, it's up close and personal. I'm staring right at you. Nowhere else to look. And so I really appreciate it. And it's, it's a good change. Sometimes I don't like change. I'm not a huge fan of change. But hey, here's what we're going to do. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Hold me to this. Um, we're going to start going live more on the phone because YouTube is incentivizing it. So we will do this. We'll do Monday and Tuesday, usually in the studio normally. Thursday, we'll be back and forth. But then I'm going to try to start going live for maybe 15 or 20 minutes a day around-ish. We'll see. Wednesdays, Thursdays, uh, Fridays, Saturdays. Do lives different days and just, you know, be on here and encourage you guys and speak to you guys and continue to grow, continue to reach people. If YouTube says this is how you're going to reach people, I'll do anything to reach people. I'll do anything to reach people. So that's why we're doing this is to reach new people. And I, I, it sounds funny when I say it, but I actually like to see people get banned and timed out. And here's why, because when people are up here acting crazy, cussing, saying dirty things, I know they're new. I know we're reaching new people and it actually shows me we're reaching people. So I actually don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm not even mad. I don't hate it when people are acting crazy. It's actually like, okay, we're reaching people. These are the people we want to reach. So Thank you guys for being here. Please so. Also, I want to challenge you, if you're not a monthly partner and you can afford it, become a monthly partner on our website. You will get invited to the Thursday at 1.30 p.m. prayer call. If you are a monthly partner on YouTube or on my website, but I recommend doing it on the website because they don't take the fee that YouTube takes, you'll get invited to the Thursday at 1.30 p.m. prayer call. Please be here Thursday at 1.30 for the prayer call. It's been amazing, powerful, refilling, refreshing. Um, again, if you're not a monthly partner, talk to your spouse, pray about it, even if it's a dollar, ten dollars, hundred dollars, twenty dollars, doesn't matter. Our partnerships go like this: up and down. People cancel. People this. People that. So we constantly are, are needing people to sign up and partner with us, so we can continue to do this. We've been doing this for five years now, and we want to keep doing it. So I really appreciate you guys. Um, I really appreciate you guys. Will we get raptured? Yes, at the end of the tribulation, we will get taken up, meet the Lord in the air, and then return as a heavenly army. That's what the Bible teaches. All right. One saint always said that a Christian can never lose their salvation. Well, Christians can't lose their salvation, but they can walk away from their salvation. They can turn from the Lord and they can reject God and in, and in turn no longer be saved. Yeah. So I do believe they can lose their salvation. I'm not what saved, always saved. Nice lightsaber. Yeah. I, you know, I got to fix up the lights here. The, the camera's not good on the phone and then YouTube degrades it and all that. So I don't know. I'm trying to make it look decent, but who knows? It's hard to be using the front facing of my phone when I have all these nice cameras here that I want to use. Is this a YouTube short live? Yes, we're in the YouTube short feed, Jaden. Yes, we are in the YouTube shorts feed right now and the YouTube live feed and on the channel. So we're on all of those. All right, so go ahead and give guys. My cash app is also in the pinned comment. If you click the pinned comment, you can see a link to cash app and then you can see a link to PayPal and all that. And I also have Zelle in the description and Venmo and all that, all right? Any other questions you guys have or you guys want to hang out and chat for a little bit here before I get off? I do have to leave in about 15 minutes, so I should probably get off soon. And we don't have Carl tonight because we're not in the studio, but tomorrow we will. Tomorrow at 6 o'clock, we'll be live with TJ Mokanji. Please be here. It's going to be great. Um, what was the verse in Matthew talking about persecution? I got you. That's in Matthew 24. And let me find you. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 9. Matthew 24, verse 9. I have my chat up open here on my computer. It's a lot bigger on the phone. It's real small. So let me just read it here on the computer. It's one thing is we always read the chat, okay? Um, deliverance map. Yeah, check our deliverance map. Deliverancemap.com or isaiasaldobar.com slash deliverance for that. That didn't take long. I'm famous where I live. What does that mean? How's the new church, bro? It's going good, American Top Gunner. Thank you, bro. We've been having a great time. Thank you. Thanks for asking, brother. Isaiah and TJ are my favorites. Is going to church important? I would. If you could find a good church, I would go. Yeah, I would go. All right. Hello from New Jersey. Hello. Fried Carl legs. Ugh. You don't want to eat fried dove legs. ChatGPT is not your friend. I don't use ChatGPT, but it's crazy, the technology. 
all these questions about like the tribulation and about the 144,000, go to my playlist guys on my YouTube channel with tribulation end time events or revelation end time events. And I have teachings on all of this. You can just scroll through and find what you want. Me uh, Malik says he's about to start the job Thursday. Pray for me. Got you. Seriously, not trying to tie you up. I just want to understand you said that we get raptured at the end, but also tell me about unbelievers being taken. Oh yeah. So what I mean by unbelievers being taken is I mean, they will be literally killed in the wrath of God. The tribulation will be the wrath of God. Billions, not millions, billions will die under the wrath of God in the tribulation. They will be taken away, swept away in God's wrath. That's what I meant by being taken away. Not like taken to heaven. They will be literally killed in the tribulation. Billions will die. If it happens now, now the world might be 20 billion people, 30 billion by the time the tribulation starts. So it could be more, but as of right now, it'll be several billion people if, if it happened right now. Waiting for you in Arizona. Hey, Yenny, I hope to see you in Arizona. I will be there April 21st. Yeah, billions will die. So go read that taken away. I hope I made it clear, guys. The second uh, Is it 2 Thessalonians 5 that I gave you? 1 Thessalonians 5. Let me give it to you one more time here. I want you to go read it. 1 Thessalonians 5 about you won't be surprised. Like, guys, I used to be pre-trib rapture. I taught it. Seven reasons why I'm pre-trib. I, I taught it. I taught hours of pre-trib. And this one verse, when I got enlightened and read this, I'm like, this can't make sense with pre-trib. Because pre-trib, if you're pre-trib, you have to believe it's random suddenly and you're shocked when the Lord takes you and your clothes are on the ground. But again, this teaches the opposite. So I have to go with the Bible. I bought your book, but it says it'll be delivered in December. My book comes out in November. So yes, they want me to start announcing the pre-orders. I will soon. I'm not going to yet, but I will. And when I announce officially the pre-orders, I would love you all to pre-order it, but it doesn't come out till November, my book on how to cast out demons. All right. Um, I used to be pre-trip. Yeah, go watch my pre-trip versus post-trip. Post, not pro-trip. Pre-trip versus post-trip with Dr. Michael Brown. I have contacts in. Thank you, guys. You already pre-ordered. Thank you. The book title is How to Cast Out Demons. If you just search Isaiah Salivar on Amazon, my book comes up, How to Cast Out Demons. I will post an announcement soon. When I post that one, you got all to go at once. So it's better if we do it all at once instead of trickle and buy it, um, but whatever. It is what it is, okay? You can rewatch it. Yeah, I usually go live at six. Okay, I gotta get off here. I love you guys so much. Thank you for giving. Again, please pray about monthly partnering and giving. It helps out a lot. I love you guys so much. God bless. I'll see you guys tomorrow night at six o'clock in the studio. Love you. Bye. See you. Bye.